Hey everybody, Maverick Christian here. In this episode, I'm going to talk about red herring maneuvers and a video by Rachel Oates responding to Caption Christianity's Questions Are Not Arguments video to help illustrate some points. Part 1 Background Cameron Bertuzzi of Caption Christianity made a video called, by the way, Questions Are Not Arguments. He claims of which include, Questions Aren't Arguments, and that while an argument might give a genuine reason to change or update one's belief. Questions don't. And I think that's more or less true. A question might help one lead to discover an argument. That argument might give a genuine reason to change one's beliefs. The question itself? Not so much because it's just a question. Well, sounds reasonable, but why bring it up? Well, as Cameron noted in his video, questions can sometimes feel like arguments. I helped illustrate this in my previous vlog episode when I played a clip from my debate with Kanderman, which I'll do so again for this episode. Some background for the clip. First, moral noncognitivism is the view that moral statements like it's morally wrong to torture infants are neither true nor false. Seems wacky to me, but some people believe it. Second, while some oughts and shoulds are purely descriptive, like when if you want to do well in school, you ought to study just means something like as a matter of practical necessity, you need to study to do well in school, some oughts prescribe in a way that is not purely descriptive. For example, someone saying you should not torture infants just for fun might have this sort of ought in mind. This is the sort of ought that morality uses, and it's the sort of ought that Candorman refers to when he talks about oughts or shoulds without a standard or context. So with that in mind, here's the Candorman debate clip. Candor, what's the, the best argument you're aware of for non-cognitivism? Uh, just ask people to explain what it means for something to... for an action to be done just for the sake of doing... well... Ask me to explain or answer the question, what does it mean when you say something should be done without any context or standard to compare it to? The problem, of course, is that isn't really an argument. Questions aren't arguments, and as such, they shouldn't convince you. You'd be better off with the real argument to have a genuine reason to change your beliefs. You know, think logically. Now, of course, none of this is to say that questions are bad or worthless. Cameron's video does not say to stop asking questions or anything like that. On the contrary, Cameron's video very specifically says that questions are really helpful, but they're not arguments. So Rachel Oates made a response video depicting Cameron saying stop asking questions in the thumbnail graphic, which, really? We can just do that now? All right, there we go. <laughs> I've totally discredited her opinions now. Finally, a woman who thinks highly of me. Part 2, Logic. This part is sort of a tangent, but it helps illustrate an important point that I think is not getting enough attention today. In Rachel's video, she says this. The original video goes on a little bit to talk about logic at this point. And so at this point, it might be helpful to explain what an argument is. Very simply, an argument is a set of premises that lead to a conclusion. So here's a quick example. Premise number one, if abortion kills a human, then it is wrong to perform abortions. Premise two, abortion kills a human. Conclusion, therefore, it is wrong to perform abortions. So the form of this argument is actually deductive. What that means is that if the first two premises are true, then the conclusion must be true, like of necessity. But notice what happens when we replace one of the premises in this argument with a question. Premise 4, if abortion kills a human, then it is wrong to perform abortions. Premise 5, does abortion kill a human? Conclusion, therefore, it is wrong to perform abortions. Turning premise 5 into a question actually means that we no longer have a valid argument. The conclusion doesn't actually follow anymore. And this is because you can use questions to, like, get information, but you can't use questions to assert information. Okay, there's some very interesting points to talk about here. So, yes, this first example here is a great example of deductive reasoning. And yes, it's logically sound, and the second example isn't. However, while it's logically sound, I completely disagree with the fact that this is a valid argument, because it's only a valid argument if you can objectively prove that those first two premises are true, and I don't think you can. Uh, she's a bit mixed up here. And logic, valid just means that the conclusion follows from the premises by the rules of logic, such that it's impossible to have true premises and a false conclusion. A valid argument can have false premises. And uh, an invalid argument is just an argument that's not valid. A sound argument is just a valid argument with true premises, regardless of whether those premises are objectively proven. In terms of a logically sound argument, I could also say, okay, one, 
If abortion kills a human, then it's wrong to perform abortions. Two, abortion does not kill humans. Three, therefore it's not wrong to perform abortions. That is also a logically sound argument. That is neither sound nor valid, that is fallacious. Let's take a look at that argument again. Premise one, if abortion kills a human, then it's wrong to perform abortions. Premise two, abortion does not kill humans. Conclusion, therefore it's not wrong to perform abortions. The structure of the argument is this, if P then Q. Not P, meaning P is false, therefore not Q. This is a notorious fallacy of denying the antecedent. To better see this fallacy, consider the following example. If I'm a one-headed monkey, then I have a head. I am not a one-headed monkey, therefore I don't have a head. The conclusion does not logically follow from the premises. Well, what Rachel did here is so egregiously illogical, it might be tempting to play the following clip out of context. I'm an idiot. Like I just did there. I think Rachel is at least as intelligent as a normal person. I don't think she's an idiot, but I do think she's a good illustration of why we need to teach logic in schools, and thus helping to illustrate the aforementioned important point that I think is not getting enough attention today, which is, logic is not part of standard K-12 education, but it really should be. Rachel's failure of logic here is nothing more than the failure of the American education system. Pretty sure she's British. Failure of the British education system. Seriously, you Brits have this problem too? Sadly, it's a widespread problem. Anyway, everybody should learn logic. I have put a link to an introductory logic series on in the description below. Really, logic and rational thought is so important, not just in philosophy, not just in apologetics, but in life generally. Part three, red herring maneuvers. A red herring is something that misleads or distracts, and a red herring fallacy, or ignoratio elenchi, is a fallacy of supposing a point proved or refuted by establishing something not at issue. For example, suppose I'm arguing that we need God to be good, and my opponent responds with this. There are lots of atheists who are good and decent people. Therefore, the idea that we need God to be good is wrong. That's an ignoratio elenchi fallacy, because while atheists being good shows that one can be good without believing in God, that's not the same thing as being good without God. How justifying arguments work is you try to say true stuff to support a claim, but it's possible to say true stuff that supports a related but somewhat different claim in a way that gives the illusion of justifying the relevant claim. So some red herring fallacies argue for a point close related to the topic at hand to have a greater chance of hoodwinking the audience. Now, some maneuvers have a structure similar to ignoratio elenchi without actually being ignoratio elenchi. To illustrate, take this scene from Thank You for Smoking, in which Nick is illustrating a rhetorical technique to his son, where his son is defending chocolate and Nick is defending vanilla as the best ice cream flavor. Editing and paraphrasing somewhat, the scene goes something like this. So you think chocolate is the end all and be all of ice cream? It's the best ice cream I wouldn't order any other. So it's all chocolate for you, is it? Yes, chocolate is all I need. Well, I need more than chocolate, and for that matter, I need more than vanilla. I believe that we need freedom and choice when it comes to our ice cream, and that is the definition of liberty. But that's not what we were talking about. Ah, but that's what I'm talking about. But you still didn't convince me. But I'm not after you. I'm after them. Nick didn't make an ignoratio elenchi. He doesn't conclude with, therefore, chocolate is the best ice cream, but he did employ a red herring. For want of a better term, we can roughly define a red herring maneuver as asserting or arguing for something not at issue, as in the context of something like responding to a claim or answering a question. Note that this definition doesn't say anything about whether the red herring is intentional. It might well be unintentional, but it can still distract or mislead. One way I think red herring maneuvers can give the illusion of justified opposition is by saying something connected to the issue. Like in this scene, Nick was still talking about ice cream, not the mating habits of dragonflies, and one's brain might subconsciously think something like, well, he said something that was correct. And if he's correct, then the person he's opposing must be incorrect. One well, that doesn't necessarily follow. It's true that when arguing against a viewpoint, you try to say true stuff to justify that opposition, but it's also possible to say true stuff that just doesn't go anywhere when it comes to attacking the truth or justification of the opposing viewpoint. And if some of that correct stuff is closely related to the topic at hand, one might get the false impression that there was a substantive refutation where no such substantive refutation existed. One way to help defeat this red herring maneuver is to employ the following analysis. Determine the position being opposed. Determine the objection to the position. Determine whether the objection attacks the position. Does the objection attack the truth or justification of the position? Is there a gap between what is claimed and what is being argued for? Now this might seem like kind of an obvious analysis to do. Of course you should keep in mind the position being opposed to, for example. But consider how some politicians have dodged questions. 
the politician starts a response with something connected to the question, and the response goes on for long enough, one might start to forget what the original question was exactly, and then not notice that the politician has dodged the question. One way to help defeat this red herring maneuver is to keep the question in mind while the, while the person is responding to the question. Or if you're an interviewer uh, presenting this in audiovisual format, keep displaying the question on screen while they're giving their response. Then it becomes more obvious that the question was dodged. In the following clip, Rachel shows something that Cameron said, says she disagrees with what Cameron said, but watch what she says after stating her disagreement. Ask yourself, is she really arguing against the truth of Cameron's claim? To help with this, I'll put a reminder box in the clip of what Cameron's actual position is. And importantly, it's arguments that give us genuine reasons to change or update our beliefs, not questions. And I disagree with this, and this is what I was just saying. I rarely change my mind about something by having facts spoken at me, by being told what to believe. I don't change my mind like that. I'm more likely to have someone change my view if they make me question ex and examine my own current beliefs and actions. If I personally can't see the flaws in my own current beliefs, I'm not going to want other beliefs coming in to replace them because I'll be like, well, why? You're not going to be able to convince me that an alternative is better until I've started to question myself why my current beliefs might not be as perfect as I thought they were. I think this whole idea of arguments convince us to change our beliefs, not questions. Quick interruption here. Note that being convincing isn't the same thing as being a genuine reason for a belief. Flacious reasoning can convince someone of a belief without it being a legitimate reason for that belief. We have something that's closely related to the topic at hand, but not quite there. Continuing. I think this whole idea of arguments convince us to change our beliefs, not questions. I think the statement and attitudes like this in general come along with um, sort of childhood indoctrination, especially amongst religious families, especially amongst Christian children. From what I've seen and learned, a lot of young children are taught in religious families. They're taught what to think, not how to think. I brought this up a couple of times, and Girl Defined is a really good example of this. There's a clip where one of the sisters turns around and she says something like, oh, I just want a list of, like, do this, do this, do this, don't do this. Like, I don't want to have to interpret the Bible. That just makes it more difficult. And I think that is so telling of so many attitudes of Christian people who have been indoctrinated from a young age. They don't necessarily know how to critically assess ideas and beliefs they don't know how to question things for themselves. They don't necessarily know how to think for themselves. They just know how to accept what is being told at them. And that's not their fault. The purpose of asking questions in an argument or a debate or whatever is to get someone to examine their own beliefs and come to their own conclusions. But if you're trying to do that with a person who's lived their whole life being told what to think instead of how to think, you might not get anywhere with them. And that's a big problem and that raises more questions and issues of how exactly do we get through to people like that? How exactly do we appeal to them? How exactly do we teach them not only how to think for themselves but that they do have to think for themselves? It raises a lot of questions that I don't have answers to. So I, I guess actually I'm going to pass this one over to you guys in the comments section. When you do have someone who from a young age has been taught what to think, not how to think, how do you get through to them? How do you make them start questioning their own beliefs? How do you teach them to think critically for themselves. I don't know. So, I don't know, tell me what you guys think. She starts off saying she disagrees, and what she says after that is connected to the issue and has critical undertones. When it comes to building a case, an argument, some reason to believe Cameron's position is incorrect, what she says doesn't really go anywhere. Now, I don't think Rachel's trying to mislead her audience. Red herring maneuvers can be unintentional, but I do think one might get the false impression of there being a substantive refutation where none existed. One's brain might subconsciously think something like, well, after she stated her disagreement, she, she said correct stuff, so then the person she's disagreeing with must be incorrect. One that doesn't necessarily follow, even if some of that correct stuff is closely related to the actual claim like it was in this case. This leads me to my second major point. Even though it's obvious that questions aren't arguments, questions can sometimes still feel like arguments. When atheists ask questions like, why would an all-loving God allow something as terrible as the Holocaust? It might be tempting to think, yeah, I mean, I can't really think of a reason why God would allow that, so maybe God doesn't exist. But none of that actually logically follows. To see why, let's spell out all the reasoning and put it into an argument. Premise number seven, I can't think of a reason why God would allow the Holocaust. Conclusion, therefore, God doesn't exist. 
The conclusion God doesn't exist doesn't actually follow from premise 7 unless we add an additional premise, number 8. If I can't think of a reason why God would allow the Holocaust, then God doesn't exist. But when you lay it out in a complete argument, you can see that the reasoning here is actually pretty weak. So yeah, this is completely missing the point here. A question like this isn't meant to be an argument in itself, it's meant to make you start questioning the stuff you take for granted and think you know. It's a lot more complicated than what he makes it out to be. A question like why would an all-loving God allow the Holocaust is actually questioning the premises of a number of logical statements, not just one. Or a number of deductive arguments, I guess you could say, not, not just one. So to oversimplify a lot, um, and this might not be 100% accurate, but just as like an example, it's more like Christians' current belief systems and like logical kind of arguments or whatever, they might involve the following deductive arguments. For example, one, if God is benevolent, he would not allow innocent people to suffer. Two, innocent people don't suffer. Three, God is benevolent. And then another one being, if God is benevolent, omnipotent, and omniscient, then the Bible is true. God is benevolent, omnipotent, and omniscient, therefore the Bible is true. And then a third one being, if the Bible is true, then God exists. The Bible is true, therefore God exists. A Christian might go through all these different steps. It's just one example of like why they believe in a God and how they got to believe in a God in the first place. But by then coming along and asking the question, okay, well, why does an all-loving God allow the Holocaust to happen? You're not going straight into the whole, you know, God existing part of the argument. You're starting way, way up here, way back. You know, you're saying, okay, hang on. So maybe the premise that innocent people don't suffer isn't accurate. So maybe that means God isn't benevolent. And if God isn't benevolent, then maybe some things in the Bible are wrong. Maybe the Bible's not infallible and true. And if the Bible's not infallible and true, then how do we know God exists? The whole process is a lot more complex than capturing Christianity makes it out to be. And I'm not sure if that's done out of ignorance or dishonesty, but either way, it needs to be critiqued. And perhaps someone who's a lot more well-versed in this kind of stuff than me could do it better, but as like a complete layperson, even I can see the flaws in his argument. Here there wasn't really any attack on the truth or justification of what he argued for. Now wait a minute, what about those flaws she talked about? Well, what flaws were those? Well, there's the fact that questions aren't intended to be arguments. In light of that Candor Man debate clip, I'm not sure that's never the case, but leave that aside for the moment. Remember what Rachel is responding to. Did Cameron say that questions are intended to be arguments? Uh, no, he didn't. Would the fact that questions aren't intended to be arguments mean that questions can't sometimes feel like arguments in the way that he described with the example he gave? No. Right, this objection doesn't attack the truth or justification of what he actually claimed. Alright, but what about the fact that it's more complicated than what Cameron made it out to be? Well, how do you mean? A question can question premises of a number of deductive arguments. Well, sometimes questions are used for that purpose, but not always. And though a question can question the premises of multiple deductive arguments, did Cameron say otherwise? Did he say that questions aren't complex in that way? Come to think of it, no, he didn't. Would the fact that questions are complex in that way mean that questions can sometimes feel like arguments in the way that he described with the example he gave? No, it wouldn't. Right. Again, we have an objection that doesn't attack the truth or justification of what he actually claimed. Rachel alluded to there being flaws in his argument in a way that might lead one to think she pointed out something wrong with the truth or justification of what he argued for. But if so, what exactly is this refutation? Huh. Strange. It sort of felt like she refuted what Cameron said, and yet, I can't think of exactly how she did it. It is somewhat remarkable. She spoke in a critical way about what Cameron said, alluded to there being flaws in his argument, and yet there was no real attack on the truth or justification of what he argued for. Now, again, red herring maneuvers can be unintentional. I don't think she tried to mislead her audience, but I do think that's the sort of thing that might deliver the illusion of a substantive refutation where none existed. Especially when accusing Cameron of ignorance or dishonesty, which I think she rather weakly argued for, to say the least. Now, to be fair, all sorts of people can do red herring maneuvers, including theists. I'll give an example in a moment from S.J. Thomason's YouTube channel, I'll link into the video in the description below. Uh, some background for the clip. Uh, first, the evidential argument from evil uses evil as evidence against theism. Simple enough. 
very roughly, skeptical theism is the idea that due to our cognitive limitations, for all we know, God has morally sufficient reasons for allowing the evil we see such that evil isn't that much evidence against theism. God's mind is literally infinitely beyond our own, so it wouldn't quite follow that God has morally sufficient reasons for allowing evil only if we have some idea of what that might be. But is skeptical theism a good maneuver for the religious person to use against the evidential argument from evil? For example, if skeptical theism would undermine a religious person's own belief, then it's, it's not such a good maneuver. With that in mind, watch how the theist reacts to Stephen Law in this clip. I mean, one of the problems with the sort of skeptical theist approach is what I call the Pandora's box uh, problem. Um, the problem is that once you say, oh, there could easily be reasons that would justify God in doing this, that, and the other thing, and just because we can't think of them, that doesn't mean that the reasons are not there, then we have to accept that there could easily be reasons for God to dupe us. Well, hold on. You... I don't have to finish the point, okay? There could be reasons for God to deceive us about whether Christianity is the true religion. There may be an excellent reason for him to trick very many people into believing that this is a true religion, perhaps even by doing a miracle, uh, when in fact it is not. If you don't know that there is, the, you know, there's unlikely to be such a reason, you can't really now believe that Christianity is true on the basis of the resurrection. Oh dear. Well, see, that, that's Look, a caricature yes, of common sense no, no, again. When, no, no, no. This, back, this, when you go back this, to philosophy, this is a consequence of skeptical theism. Another consequence of skeptical theism is once you say, oh, but there could easily be reasons, Stephen, for the, for the various pain and suffering that we see in the world, well, then there could easily be reasons for God to deceive us about the existence of the external world. You're only How looking at it from a surface level. You're not looking at the overall philosophical and historic background. What about these, all these arguments for the existence of God offered by uh, Augustine? Aristotle, Aquinas, uh, yeah. Plato with the Demiurge, and, and so forth. You, it seems to me that you're you're cherry picking and you're making extravagant and, by the way, an extraordinary claim in well, saying that God funny. doesn't have reasons to, for allowing gratuitous evil in the world. Well, it seems to me that it's un highly unlikely to have reasons to, to kill children on an industrial scale over two hundred thousand years, and you're saying no, no. So, so God, so God should supersede the laws of uh, the, the general true. laws of physics every time that we are in a in a uh, a problem area where something bad could happen. Saying, For one thing, one one thing, uh, Ed Fazier says that one that would prohibit us from growing spiritually, and yes. a lot of uh, philosophers have have made this argument. Let me let me interrupt here real really quickly. I want to see if if maybe we should go a little bit back to a bit of structure because I, I both of you are trying to get your points out and I feel like neither of you are able to do it fully. So um, do you want to do that? Do you want to each maybe? Well, maybe we should go to uh, another topic. Um, well, no, because we are I'm talking so about Christianity too. No, um, no, I mean uh, one of the other things. Could that, I just, could I just okay. say something? I don't particularly, I'm not here, I, don't, I, I would much rather people just go away with a clear idea about skeptical theism and maybe the even argument against naturalism than the, not the, I win the debate, to be perfectly honest. I'm not, so, so let me just, let me just set out the skeptical theist stall. The skeptical theist is someone who doesn't necessarily attempt to come up with the reasons why God allows the suffering. They say, I haven't, but they may say, I don't know what the reasons are, but they then add that for all we know as human beings, there could be such reasons. But um, that's not how it ends, though. You're, you're forgetting a few things, Dr. Law, the whole history and philosophy behind it, that there are a substantial history of natural theology of people given these sophisticated arguments that show that on other independent grounds, uh, Christianity or theism or Christianity yeah. in particular is, is rational. Yes, no, that, that may be true, but I'm, what we're looking at here is specifically the response to the evidential problem of evil that is known as skeptical theism, which is where people say, for all we know, there's a reason for these evils, just because we can't think of the reason doesn't mean that the re reason is not there. And that was your move. You but but your but my, all, all my move um, takes this as a whole. I'm looking at all of these arguments. Saying I just explain what is that move. <laughs> that one 
is going to get you into a lot of trouble. Uh, if you take it, if you take it in isolation, anything will get you in trouble. But you never take an argument <laughs> or something in isolation. But you look at the broader philosophical context and the indep- the other independent reasons for thinking that God That's is what? holy good and God yeah. acts mm-hmm. according to mutable and perfect holiness and laws. We can, we can, okay, we can look at those, and I'd be very happy to look at those. And obviously, it's going to be difficult to look at all these different arguments. In well, can the can, can we move on to <laughs> other things, like other things in in our uh, openings? Well, what I don't want to do is to have a conversation where there's just this very superficial hand wavy. What about this argument? And what about that argument? And we don't even distinguish the arguments or even look, analyze them properly. Uh, the minute it looks like you're getting into trouble, you just shift to some other arguments, right? That does appear to be what happened in this particular case. Part of being a rational, critical thinker is to recognize when your side makes mistakes. And whether you're an, you're an atheist or you're a religious believer, your side makes mistakes. Part 4. Conclusion In this concluding segment, I'd like to conclude with some tips about how to deal with red herring maneuvers. Not only in spotting them, but in avoiding them yourself. Because, as I've said over and over, red herring maneuvers can be unintentional. You know, both sides have used them. I mean, I've used them on occasion. I've made mistakes. Tip number one is to avoid straw men and employ the principle of charity. A straw man is a mischaracterization of what someone says that's easier to attack than the actual position. So one way to accidentally employ the red herring maneuver is to attack a straw man instead of discussing the actual topic at hand. One way to help avoid accidentally making straw man is to employ the principle of charity, which says to interpret what someone is saying in the most reasonable light that plausibly fits what they're saying. For example, Cameron said this. And importantly, it's arguments that give us genuine reasons to change or update our beliefs, not questions. A charitable interpretation would be that a question does not itself constitute a genuine reason for changing one's beliefs. An uncharitable interpretation would be that questions can't even indirectly bring about a chain of events that leads one to discover a genuine reason for one's beliefs. By actively and aggressively being charitable towards your opponents, you're less likely to make a straw man mistake. Tip number two, learn logic. There are rules of logic like these that guarantee true conclusions and given true premises. Learning rules of logic helps one think more logically and get a better intuitive feel for logical validity. And if you know if you constructed a logically valid argument with a relevant conclusion, you can at least know that your premise is that, that what you're saying at least goes somewhere relevant. So you can potentially use this logical strategy to help you avoid ignoratio elenchi and certain other logical fallacies like the fallacy of denying the antecedent. Tip number three, think analytically. Learning logic helps one think analytically. And then there is this analysis I mentioned earlier where you try to identify the specific objection and whether it attacks a certain specific position. Here's another example of analytical thinking. Consider the following moral argument for God. Premise 1. If God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. Moral objectivism says that there are moral truths that exist independently of our belief and perception of them. Premise 2. Objective moral values and duties do exist. Conclusion. Therefore, God exists. Notice that listing out the premises like this makes it easier to see the components of the argument. We can see that the argument is logically valid, that is, the conclusion follows from the premises inescapably by the rules of logic. And as always, a sound argument is just a valid argument with true premises. So, what about justification for those premises? My justification for the first premise is that given that God does not exist, it is likely that objective morality does not exist, which entails that the first premise is probably true due to a theorem of mathematics and propositional logic I have mentioned in my vlog series. If you want more detail on this, you can see my debate with former president and co-founder of Internet Infidels Jeffrey J. Lauder on the moral argument. But to summarize my approach, it basically involves assuming for sake of argument that God does not exist, combine that with our background knowledge of the way the world is, and argue that this leads to objective morality probably not existing. Such that if you're an atheist and you believe there's no objective morality, you believe that given that God does not exist, objective morality probably doesn't exist. And thus the power of logic would compel you to accept the first premise as at least probably true. What about justifying the second premise? Well, one way to show that there is such a thing as objective moral truth is to give a good example. It is morally wrong and evil for a man to torture infants just for fun, even if a baby torturer thought otherwise and killed everyone who disagreed with him. So here we have something morally wrong and evil, even if all human opinion says otherwise, and we have our example. I think this is pretty strong justification, because otherwise, what's the alternative? Are you going to believe this? 
It's not morally wrong for a man to torture an infant just for fun as long as the baby torturer thinks otherwise and kills everyone who disagrees with him. That's not a reasonable belief, obviously. Now imagine someone gives this response to that moral argument. Consider this youth of objection. Does God command something because it's good or is it good because God commands it? If it's the first option, then morality exists independently of God and God doesn't ground morality. If it's the second option, then what is morally good would become arbitrary. God could command us to eat our children and it would be good. But morality isn't arbitrary. So God doesn't ground morality and the moral argument fails. A lot could be said about Euthyphro, but for now, let's assume for sake of argument that God does not ground morality. Now let's think analytically. Which premise does this objection attack? Remember, this is a logically valid argument. The only way it can fail to be sound is with a false premise. So which premise does this objection attack? The first premise doesn't say that God grounds morality. Indeed, it doesn't even require that God exists, much less that he grounds anything. Many atheists agree with me that, given that God does not exist, it is likely that objective morality does not exist. Both the first premise and its justification are quite compatible with God not existing, and are thus quite compatible with God not grounding morality. This objection does not attack the second premise, nor does it even attack the conclusion. The conclusion says God exists, but doesn't say whether he grounds morality. This objection is actually an ignoratio elenchi, a red herring fallacy, supposing a point proved by arguing for something not at issue. When examining an objection against a logically valid argument, consider whether the objection attacks the truth or justification of any of the argument's premises. Because if a valid argument's premises are justifiably true, then the conclusion follows inescapably, regardless of what else might be true. Such is the magic of logic. So I guess this will about wrap it up. This is Maverick Krish inviting you to go in peace, serve the Lord, and love logic. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, hit the like button. If you want to see more videos, hit subscribe and ring the bell.